You know what? There's something I keep noticing here on YouTube, and not only here. I see a lot of blindness and a strange kind of extremization when it comes to reality, to history, and to truth in general. We live in the age of mass media and we're constantly bombarded with conflicting information. Men who went to the moon and conspiracies saying they never did. The result, in the end, every piece of information loses value. Anything that slightly deviates from the mainstream narrative is automatically dismissed as fake. But at the same time, that same official narrative becomes so fossilized in its own position that it ends up losing contact with reality, with history, with authentic truth. So today I hope we can switch off the spotlights and all this media noise for a moment and dive into the real story of who invented the telephone. I want to show you how the general belief is often distorted and far away from historical reality. Let's start from one fact. Yes, it's true that the industrialization of the telephone was carried out by Alexander Graham Bell, but this story is much more complicated than it seems. The telephone, understood as a device that allows the human voice to be transmitted through electricity, was invented by Antonio Meucci. And I'm not saying this out of national pride. It is the United States Congress itself that, with an official resolution, has recognized this historical truth. So is Bell an imposter? A fraud? A thief who stole the idea? Well, it's not that simple. Reality is more nuanced. Bell did in fact reach the same result, but he did it later than Meucci. And on his side, he had a fundamental advantage, a much stronger and more structured scientific background. You need to understand the context. On one side, there was Antonio Meucci, a self-taught Italian inventor, a man still deeply rooted in the culture and mentality of the 19th century. On the other side, there was Bell, already projected into the 20th century with formal scientific training, economic resources, and a network of connections that Meucci couldn't even dream of. This story teaches us something fundamental. Historical truth is rarely black and white, good guys versus bad guys. Very often, public and official recognition goes to those who have the resources, the tools, and the power to impose their version of events, not necessarily to those who truly have more merit or who arrived first. There is much more to say about this story, and with this video, I hope to walk you through the whole thing in detail. The goal is that when you look at a telephone, when you hold it in your hand, you will no longer think only of Graham Bell. You will also think, and above all, of Antonio Meucci, a forgotten genius who deserves to be remembered. And with this video, I also want to take a few seconds to pay tribute to my Italian-American brothers and sisters for what they have been able to do, for what they achieved in the history of the United States of America, and for everything they went through for decades and which today is largely forgotten. Yes, because my friends, Racism against Italians in the United States was brutal, often much harsher than what we see today against Mexicans, Asians, or African Americans. This is also a tribute to the strength of a people who are anything but self-referential, and who somehow always manage to surprise, to give their best precisely in the worst moments. From stinking criminals with moustaches to being applauded in the United States, to making the history of cinema to changing the culture of the very country they migrated to. And it is not just about spaghetti and pizza. We're talking about cinema, culture, entertainment, sport, that in so many cases were decisively shaped by Italian Americans who were only a small percentage of the American population. Is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that one of the greatest singers of all time, Frank Sinatra, was Italian American? that one of the greatest baseball players, Joe DiMaggio, was Italian-American, that some of the most famous singers in the world, like Madonna or Lady Gaga, have Italian roots, that so many of the most influential filmmakers and actors in Hollywood come from Italian families, that among the most decorated soldiers of the Second World War, there is an impressive number of Italian surnames. Well, guys, thank you. Thank you for proving, beyond any doubt, that being an immigrant can become a decisive factor, that with talent, sacrifice, and determination, you can change the history of an entire nation. And this video is about one of you, one of us, a man who was chasing the American dream and who unfortunately never saw that dream come true. In fact, for him, it almost turned into a cruel joke.
Cuba, autumn 1849. In a small laboratory adjacent to the Gran Teatro, Antonio Miucci, a 41-year-old Florentine, theater machinist and self-taught inventor, is conducting an electrotherapy session on a patient suffering from rheumatism, a common practice at the time. To regulate the current, Miucci inserts a wire in the patient's mouth and as a precaution, a second wire in his own mouth. He walks into another room and activates a 114-volt battery. The voltage is excessive. The patient lets out a cry of pain, but Miucci hears that cry with stunning clarity. Not through the air, not attenuated by distance. The sound comes directly from his mouth, as if the patient's voice had traveled along the electric wire. In that instant, almost by chance, Antonio discovers the transmission of voice by electrical means. He has discovered the telephone. Miucci immediately understands the scope of the discovery. In the following months, he perfects the device. In 1850, he creates the first working prototype of the speaking telegraph, as he calls it. He shows it to some Cuban officials and Italian merchants on the island. Everyone is impressed, but no one has the capital to invest. In 1850, Miucci decides to move to the United States, where he hopes to find the resources to develop his invention. He arrives in Staten Island, New York, with his wife Esther and his friend Giuseppe Garibaldi, whom he will host in his home for several years. In Staten Island, Miucci is forced to work in a candle factory to survive but he never abandons his invention. Between 1850 and 1860, he continuously perfects his apparatus, building over 30 different prototypes. In 1856, he installs a permanent telephone connection between his laboratory on the ground floor and the bedroom on the first floor, where his wife Esther, ill and bedridden, can communicate with him while he works. It's the first domestic telephone line in history. It works perfectly for years. In 1860, Miucci performs a public demonstration of his speaking telegraph in an Italian theater in New York. The Italian-American press talks about it, but the large American public is not reached. Miucci speaks little English, is poor, has no connections in the industrial establishment. In 1871, after years of sacrifice, Miucci finally manages to file a caveat with the United States Patent Office. The caveat is not a complete patent, it costs only $10 instead of $250, but it reserves the invention for one year, renewable. It's all Miucci can afford. Miucci renews the caveat every year, laboriously paying $10. In the document, he describes in detail the principle of voice transmission through variable electric current, the vibrating diaphragm, the permanent magnet, all the fundamental elements of the modern telephone. But in 1873, an event occurs that will change everything. Miucci is the victim of a serious accident on a ferry. The explosion of a boiler injures him severely. He spends months in the hospital. His wife must sell many of his prototypes and documents to pay the medical expenses. When Miucci recovers, he is even poorer than before. He can no longer pay the $10 to renew the caveat. In 1874, the caveat expires. Meanwhile, Miucci has desperately tried to interest investors. In 1871, he brings some prototypes to the Western Union Telegraph Company, the largest telecommunications company in America. He asks to meet the executives to show his invention. He is promised a meeting. He waits two years. In 1873, he asks for the return of the materials. They tell him they have been lost. Those same prototypes, those documents, were in the Western Union offices when a young teacher of the deaf named Alexander Graham Bell began to frequent that environment assiduously. February 14, 1876. Alexander Graham Bell files a patent for an apparatus for transmitting voice telegraphically. A few hours later, in the same patent office in Washington, another inventor, Elisha Gray, files a caveat for an identical device. Bell gets the patent. Gray doesn't. An extraordinary coincidence, one might say. But there's a disturbing detail. Bell filed the patent before having a working apparatus. His laboratory notes show that he builds the first truly operational telephone only two weeks later, on March 10, 1876, when he utters the famous phrase, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. But there's more. The technical drawings in Bell's patent describe a variable resistance transmitter immersed in acidulated water a design that Bell had never experimented with before. 
It's exactly the design that Alicia Gray had described in his caveat, filed the same day. How is this possible? Years later, the examiner Zainas Wilbur signed an affidavit claiming he had been bribed and had shown Bell the contents of Gray's caveat in exchange for money. A highly controversial document, but one that has since fueled suspicions about the correctness of the procedure. Bell himself noted in his diaries just five days after obtaining the patent that he had modified the design following indications received informally at the patent office. But the real question is, where did Bell get the original idea from? Bell was working on harmonic telegraphy, a system for transmitting multiple telegraph signals on the same line. He had never worked on voice transmission. And here we return to Miyuchi. The prototypes and documents that Miyuchi had left at Western Union in 1871 had disappeared in 1873. Bell began working intensely on the telephone precisely in that period. Bell had direct connections with Western Union. His father-in-law, Gardner Green Hubbard, was a business partner with the company and was trying to break Western Union's monopoly by founding a competing company. On March 9, 1876, the day before his famous demonstration, Bell writes in his notes a revealing phrase, I have finally found the way to make the variable transmitter work. Which variable transmitter? The one that Miyuchi had described in his caveat of 1871, now expired? When Miyuchi reads in the newspapers that Bell has patented the telephone, he is devastated. He writes letters, seeks lawyers, collects testimonies, but he is poor, doesn't speak English well, is almost 70 years old. Bell instead is supported by powerful financiers. In 1877, he founds the Bell Telephone Company, which will become one of the largest industrial empires in history. Miucci doesn't give up. In 1886, he manages to file a lawsuit against Bell, but he doesn't have the money for a private lawyer. His case is joined to a broader proceeding, the United States government against the Bell Telephone Company for patent fraud. In 1887, the trial begins. It's an explosive case. If Bell loses, his patent is annulled, and the telephone empire collapses. Miyuchi's lawyers present devastating evidence. Witnesses who had seen Miyuchi's telephones working in the 50s and 60s, documents, newspaper articles, even Giuseppe Garibaldi had written attestations about Miyuchi's priority. But the Bell Telephone Company has immense resources. It bribes witnesses, buries documents, prolongs the trial with delaying tactics. In 1889, Antonio Miucci dies, poor and defeated, at the age of 81. The trial continues without him. In 1897, after 10 years of legal battles, the evidence against Bell appears increasingly damning according to many observers of the time. But between a Supreme Court ruling favorable to the Bell Telephone Company and a change in political climate, the federal government decides to definitively abandon the case. The practical result is clear. The telephone empire remains intact, and the truth about Miyuchi remains buried. The truth is buried. For a century, the name of Antonio Miyuchi disappears from official history. In textbooks, encyclopedias, celebrations, Alexander Graham Bell is celebrated as the inventor of the telephone. Miyuchi becomes a footnote at best, but the truth cannot remain hidden forever. Throughout the 20th century, independent historians begin to investigate. Documents, letters, testimonies emerge. The reconstruction of the facts becomes increasingly precise, increasingly incontrovertible. In 2002, after years of pressure from the Italian-American community and science historians, the United States House of Representatives approves Resolution 269, which calls for recognizing the life and achievements of Antonio Miucci and recognizing his work in the invention of the telephone going so far as to write in black and white that if he had been able to pay the $10 to maintain the caveat, no patent could have been granted to Bell. In practice, it's the posthumous recognition that the telephone, before becoming Bell's business, was Miucci's invention. Miucci's story is not just a matter of historical justice. It's a story that speaks to us about the present. It tells us how economic power can rewrite reality. Bell had the capital, the connections, the lawyers, Miucci had only genius and truth, and for a century genius and truth lost. It tells us how true innovation, the kind that comes from pure curiosity and necessity, often emerges from unexpected places, an electrotherapy laboratory in Cuba, a candle factory in Staten Island, 
not from centers of power, not from prestigious universities, but from independent minds that observe the world with new eyes. It tells us about the relationship between discovery and credit. Miucci discovered the telephone in 1849. Bell patented it in 1876, 27 years later. But Bell is remembered as the inventor. Why? Because he had the means to transform a discovery into an industry. Capitalism rewards those who commercialize, not necessarily those who invent. And it tells us, finally, about a problem that still persists today. Intellectual theft facilitated by institutions. The lost prototypes at Western Union, the patent approved thanks to a corrupt official, the trial buried by the government. How many other stories like Miyuchi's are buried in the archives? How many inventors have been robbed of their discoveries by those who had more power? What happened to Miyuchi today happens to researchers working in universities who see patents end up with multinationals, to open source developers whose work is packaged and sold by others, to startups that are bought only to silence a better idea. Miyuchi's story reminds us that truth, however strong, needs to be defended. That genius, without justice, can be trampled. And that often, the names we learn as fathers of an invention are actually just the winners of an economic and legal battle, not the true pioneers. Antonio Miucci died poor, forgotten, defeated. But his story in the end has emerged. It's a posthumous belated victory, but it's a victory. And it teaches us that it's always worth fighting for the truth, even when it seems that power has already decided who must win. Because history, sooner or later, settles accounts with itself. And when it does, names like Antonio Meucci shine again, while empires built on deception, however powerful, show their rotten foundations. The telephone we use every day, that smartphone we keep in our pocket, descends directly from that accidental discovery in a Cuban laboratory in 1849. Every time we talk on the phone, we're using Antonio Meucci's invention. It's time the world knew.